Aloft. Welcome, Boards Insiders. My name is Christopher Bridegan, and I am the creative director here at Inside the Boards. Inspired by the HBO miniseries Chernobyl, I am pleased to introduce our own miniseries about the events of Chernobyl, and specifically radiation and its effects on the body. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter at ITB Sides to see the fun side of Inside the Boards. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. And now here's your host, Patrick Beeman. All right, welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast. I am Patrick Beeman, your usual host. Today with me is Dr. Gregory Thompson, who is a radiation oncologist, joining us today to discuss a little bit about radonc and radiation. So, Greg, do you want to go ahead and just give us a little intro as far as your background goes? Sure. Yeah, nice to be here. Um, uh, like you said, I'm a radiation oncologist live in Ohio. I grew up in Ohio, uh, initially grew up in Columbus, went on to medical school at Wright State University in Dayton, and on to uh, residency at the University of Cincinnati in radiation oncology. And I now practice in a uh, large rural hospital in kind of a more of a community practice type setting, uh, but hospital-based setting uh, in radiation oncology. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And uh, I'm going to ask you a few things about radonc as a specialty, but it sounds like you're thoroughly Ohioan, just like me. Yeah, that's right. I uh, spent about two years in Kentucky. Uh, my dad is a medical oncologist, and he did his fellowship at the University of Kentucky. So from the age of two to four, I lived in Lexington. And other than that, I've lived in Ohio. Yeah. And actually, um, Greg is married to Alicia Thompson, who was one of my uh, attendings during residency at Wright-Patterson slash Wright State University's OBGYN program, which is how we know each other. And Greg is also, well, and Alicia, our early contributors to ITB to help us get this thing off the ground. So double thanks uh, in that respect. Yeah, again, happy to be a part of it. All right, sweet. So uh, I We'll start out with some, I guess, about radonc as a specialty. Why did you choose that? I guess starting off, radonc's a really small specialty. So most, I think, medical students and even residents, probably even attendings, get very little exposure to it. I was fortunate enough uh, because my father's a medical oncologist when I was a second year resident, or excuse me, second year medical student, starting to think about what types of fields I was going to be uh, looking at as I went into my clinical years. He said that I should shadow a radiation oncologist, uh, which I did in Columbus, kind of going into my third year and um, just really loved it. Uh, Still went into third year open to different specialties, but pretty quickly uh, within probably the first six months realized that that's what I wanted to pursue. Um, Reasons I like it, uh, it's just a nice blend of multiple different things. So I certainly grew up in in the world of oncology. My dad being a medical oncologist and my mom was a oncology nurse for years. Uh, so I was familiar with uh, cancer, uh, but also because it's it really is a nice blend of clinical work, um, technical work, procedural work, and then just uh, blessed to be with patients as they walk the, the journey of their cancer diagnosis and treatment and you know whatever outcome uh, may come from that. Yeah, totally. And in that uh, practice setting, do you hold clinics, and how often do you usually, say, see a patient um, as far as like a, a time frame goes during their own cancer journey, if you will? Yeah, so we tend to be a specialty that's um, what I would call like a tertiary referral. So, you know, there's a primary care, and then oftentimes the diagnosis of cancer is made either by a medical oncology or surgeon. Uh, and then are referred to us. Um, so by the time most, and, and this isn't true for every cancer clinic, but I think uh, mostly true, by the time folks kind of walk in my door, they have a diagnosis of, of cancer. And so, you know, what I'll initially do is see the patient in consultation and then, you know, say, okay, yes, you need radiation or you don't. Um, and if they do need radiation, then they'll kind of start the process of planning and designing out that Uh, treatment course, uh, then they'll start on that course, which is usually anywhere from a single treatment 
uh, but more commonly somewhere between like two and seven to eight weeks of uh, daily treatment Monday through Friday. Um, during that phase of their treatment, I'll see them every week. Uh, and then after that and follow up, just depending on what they have and how often they need to be seen for, you know, every several months for, you know, anywhere for a couple of years to five, 10 years, depending on their disease. Okay. Radonk's a pretty competitive specialty. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And it's uh, kind of ebbed and flowed in, in terms of how competitive it's been over the years. And initially started as a specialty that kind of branched out from uh, radiology. Um, there were some years, I think, where it was really so unknown that it was not very competitive. But as um, it's kind of come into more of the mainstream, uh, it's become more competitive over the last, I'd say, 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And that being said, um, were you a perfect medical student? No, I, I don't know what that would even be, being a perfect medical student. But um, exactly. you know, I, I, I certainly uh, you know, kind of gave my, my best at it and enjoyed it. You know, it was different than, you know, previous parts of my life where, you know, when even in college, you're doing college and you're doing extracurricular stuff and you're doing work in where when you get to medical school, you're really able to kind of focus on medical school. Or at least I was able to. And so, you know, I'd say I did that, but certainly made mistakes along the way. <laughs> it wasn't a smooth path. Well, yeah. And um, I, I asked that just because usually we end up asking guests if they're willing to share or have any, you know, so-called test taking failures or problematic academic parts of their medical education. I'd say for me, um, you know, probably the biggest struggle that I had is, um, as you mentioned, the specialty is very competitive and I knew I wanted to do it, but I had gone to a uh, medical school that was really geared towards primary care. There was no radiation oncology residency. So any exposure that I had um, had to be from outside of my medical school with away rotations in my fourth year. And I went to a relatively unknown medical school as well. So didn't have really a strong medical school name to back me up. My uh, USMLE scores were decent. They weren't amazing. And then I didn't really know anybody in the field. And so I did two away rotations, and when I went to apply for residency, those are the only two radiation oncology interviews that I got. Um, and so, you know, they were you know, the statistics. I think are that you need to be like eight to ten, you know, interviews for Radonk in order to match, and I had two. And so, I was already thinking of backup plans, uh, but was fortunate enough that uh, Doctor. Uh, Bill Barrett at University of Cincinnati, um, who's the uh, chairman of the cancer program there now and was previously the, the chairman of radiation oncology. Um, he may still carry that title, actually, I'm not sure, but chose to, to pick me. So sometimes knowing the right people or just falling into meeting the right people and, and the right path. Absolutely. Um, so if you were to give advice to medical students, since you guys do keep your specialty so secret, um, <laughs> if they were interested in pursuing a career in Radonc, when do they need to start uh, thinking about that and what would be like the first step? And when I say when, I mean first year, second year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's always days where you could find a day to go shadow somebody. So, you know, that would be the first thing I would do is just go and see if it's even interesting. I had no interest in physics when I was in college. And the fact that I ended up going into a field where, you know, physics is a big part of my job every day uh, is, you know, kind of not something I would have guessed. Let's just say that. Uh, but <laughs> when I when I went and saw what it looked like in real life, I really liked it. But we had plenty of medical students when I was a resident that came through thinking that they would like it. And they said, no, I don't have any interest in, you know, the the physics and the sitting behind a computer and, um, you know, contouring and doing those kinds of things. So first thing is just to get some exposure to it, to see if it's something you're interested in. Yeah, I would say it is interesting as your specialty is. And, and actually, I I somewhat have thought, man, I wish I would have done that because I, I went to residency uh, in OBGYN thinking I would do GYN oncology. And then by the end of second year, I was like, I could not be a trainee another <laughs> six years or something. Hey, guys, sorry for the interruption, but here's a quick message about a new project from Inside the Boards. We offer you free resources that help you redeem some of your time so you have it to spend with family, friends, and keeping yourself healthy and well. We are launching a crowdfunding campaign because we need help creating our app. 
Yes, we're like halfway done with it, but we still need a little bit of funds in order to get it off the ground more quickly. Become a part of building Inside the Boards with us. Head over to insidetheboards.com slash support to learn more. And now back to the show. So, Chernobyl, what happened? The world's worst civilian nuclear disaster took place when a reactor exploded at the Chernobyl power plant in Ukraine, then part of the Soviet Union. Present-day Belarus received 60% of the initial fallout. The radioactive cloud spread further to cover most of Europe. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant was one of the Soviet Union's most advanced facilities. The first two reactors became operational in the late 1970s. The fourth reactor was the newest, going online in 1983. On April 26, 1986, technicians prepared to test the backup cooling system in reactor number four, but the routine safety drill went horribly wrong. A nuclear reactor is like a giant steam engine. Uranium fuel rods react to produce a massive amount of heat. That converts water into steam, which drives huge turbines to generate electricity. Control rods are inserted in between the uranium to slow the reaction. And it's crucial for cooling water to be pumped around the core to prevent overheating. But as the test began, almost all of the control rods were removed, and technicians lost control of the flow of coolant. Temperatures soared, and extreme heat began to melt the core. At 1.23 a.m., Reactor 4 exploded. It spewed eight tons of radioactive debris into the atmosphere. 115,000 people were evacuated from a 30-kilometer zone around the plant. The battle to put out the fires inside lasted for 15 days. More than a half a million military and civilian personnel were drafted to deal with the accident and its aftermath. 31 of the initial firefighters and plant workers died within days from acute radiation sickness. The toxicity of the radioactive cloud was equivalent to 400 Hiroshima atomic bomb explosions. Crews hastily built a concrete sarcophagus to encase the entire reactor to prevent more radiation from spreading. Inside, there remained 200 tons of radioactive fuel. The remaining three reactors continued to operate due to energy shortages in Ukraine. It wasn't until the year 2000 that the Chernobyl complex was completely shut down. Well, I think that's a good segue. So um, kind of our goals uh, uh, throughout this series of episodes, um, they're going to be to, to kind of focus and draw out some of the uh, medical aspects of uh, radiation exposure, the diseases people deal with um, in line with this Chernobyl series, which if you guys haven't seen that on HBO, it's well worth a watch. Um, but also to um, get into a little bit of the basic uh, physics uh, medically related that uh, are important to your specialty and a little bit on how radiation is used as a therapeutic modality. So if we can start, tell me about, uh, this would be a broad question, tell me about radiation. How does it work? What is it? I guess that may be very broad, but. One of the places I think that's a good place to start is from a therapeutic side um, to think about, you know, what are the two major sources of, of radiation? And that's going to be any man-made or machine-generated radiation versus some sort of radioactive material. Um, and so some of the terminology then uh, comes from that where, you know, for radiation generating machines, we're mostly looking at X-ray uh, radiation generating both on the diagnostic side as well as on the therapy side. Uh, just a brief kind of introduction to that. For a diagnostic X-ray, is usually something in the kilovolt strength, somewhere around probably 30 to 120, 150 kV. That's kilovoltage. Versus on the therapy side, it's going to be a megavoltage strength uh, X-ray. And so the way that those X-rays behave in tissue is different. The other is uh, radiation material, uh, which is some sort of element that is undergoing nuclear decay and giving off some form of radiotherapy. Generally, uh, the three types that are, are useful, at least, or 
uh, part of kind of radiation exposure or therapy are going to be alpha particles, which is basically a helium beta particle, which is essentially an electron, and then uh, gamma rays, which are uh, equivalent essentially to X-rays. Yeah, so and and that's part of my interest in this too, because there's a lot of physics words thrown around. They talk about ionizing radiation versus background radiation, and ionizing radiation is is the type that makes ions from non-ionic uh, atomic or molecular material, right? That's what mostly gamma rays. That's right. So the ionizing effect is a photon generally um, of a certain energy is having a interaction with a orbital electron. And there's kind of two different ways that that happens. One is the photoelectric effect and one is through what's called Compton scattering. And each of those is is different in terms of how we utilize that. Uh, but that ability to create um, a free radical ion then can be damaging to DNA. And that's that's really the target for me every day is um, double strand DNA breaks in tumor cells that are lethal, essentially make that cell unable to replicate uh, and eventually as it lives out its um, cellular life to die by whatever means and not be able to replace itself and continue to grow. Okay, so if you're talking about a cell, just your run-of-the-mill somatic cell in the body, it's exposed to ionizing radiation. And I guess there could be uh, one of three outcomes. The cell dies, the cell DNA breaks and is repaired, or the DNA is damaged to the point where it can't repair and is uh, mutated. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I would, the, the word mutated there may fall into both the circumstances that you described, um, option two and three. So there's this idea of sublethal damage with radiation, and that would be generally a single strand DNA break, uh, which is fairly easily corrected by the cell's innate DNA repair mechanisms. We do have double-stranded DNA repair mechanisms as well. They work better in certain phases of the cell cycle, but generally double-stranded DNA breaks causes various chromosomal aberrations uh, that then are lethal when a cell goes to try to complete mitosis or can even be um, fatal before that. So I guess, and and I, I imagine that the amount or dose of the, the radiation determines the, the outcome to that cell. Is it kind of a linear relationship? It's very complicated. So <laughs> okay. at that point, you have to start looking at both energy as well as the type of uh, particle that's being described. Um, for instance, if you take a photon and the way that a photon interacts in tissue again, kind of ejecting electrons, most of the then biological ev events are because of that electron kind of ping-ponging around in that tissue, versus if you take something like a proton, which has both charge and mass, proton therapy is being used more and more commonly for therapy, um, that's going to have a different um, there's the energy deposition of that particle is going to be different than a photon at the end of its range. And so it, it, it becomes quite complicated, yeah. We're exposed constantly to a certain amount of radiation from our natural environment. So every exposure is not expected to result in harm. It's the amount of exposure. It's how much radiation we're exposed to. It's the dose that determines potential health outcomes. I want to talk about ionizing radiation, which is X-rays and gamma rays. So what happens at the higher energy side of the electromagnetic spectrum, these forms of radiation interact with matter. They have enough energy to remove an electron from an atom. And when they do that, the atom becomes charged or ionized. So that's why we call these ionizing radiation, because they have a capability to ionize atoms when they interact with them. This is a unique property that is, other, these other forms of radiation, including what we get out of a cell phone, don't do that. So in this training, we're going to focus exclusively on ionizing radiation. Even though we might just say radiation for simplicity, but really mean, what we really mean is ionizing radiation. So how does radiation damage living tissue? Ionizing radiation can break bonds in molecules, any molecule. Inside the cell, it does the same thing. And as with other toxins, our genetic material, DNA, is the primary target. 
And radiation can damage DNA directly by interacting with the molecule or indirectly. And that means we have plenty of water molecules in our cells. So radiation will interact with water, break down our water molecules, produce free radicals, and then free radicals will damage our DNA. That's an indirect method. But that's how ionizing radiation can damage our cells. So what happens once a cell is irradiated and is damaged, the DNA is damaged? Well, it can repair itself faithfully to how it was before the damage. So the cell is repaired and there's normal function and the cell would go on. Another thing that can happen is that it could misrepair, repair it incorrectly. So the cell becomes an altered cell. And then that cell has potential eventually to perhaps turn into cancerous cell. There's that potential. Alternatively, after the cell is damaged, the cell can die. So cell death is the outcome. And actually, that's not a bad thing. Because if only a few cells die, then the function of that tissue is not impaired. And we don't have a potential for a misrepair cell to later on cause harm to us. But if there is a lot of damage, if the dose is high and there's a large number of cells that uh, die, then that impairs the function of that organ. And that's not good. We get organ failure at that point. So these are the three outcomes. What does the radiation do to them, precisely? Oh, the level, some of them are exposed. Ionizing radiation tears the cellular structure apart. The skin blisters, turns red, then black. This is followed by a latency period. The immediate effects subside. The patient appears to be recovering. Healthy even, but they aren't. This usually only lasts for a day or two. Then the cellular damage begins to manifest. The bone marrow dies. The immune system fails. The organs and soft tissue begin to decompose. The arteries and veins spill open like sieves to the point where you can't even administer morphine for the pain, which is unimaginable. Within three days to three weeks, you're dead. Um, well, let's take a, a question then, um, since most of this is uh, focused on learning the sorts of things in medical school that you need to know for boards, but... Um, I mean, we are taking a different tack here just because this is, I think, more interesting than uh, some of the usual fare that we discuss. But um, I'll read uh, one of our USMLE-style questions. We have a 27-year-old female brought to the emergency department following a nuclear disaster in Pripyat, Ukraine. After a thorough workup by the medical staff, potassium iodide is administered to help mitigate the damage to crucial internal structures. Which of the following organs is the target of therapy for the administered drug? And our answer choices are A, the spleen, B, the thyroid, C, the thymus, or D, the bone marrow. So based on probably what we just said, um, the, the answer is probably obvious that um, the, the reason the potassium iodide is given is to mitigate uh, the damage that would occur to internal structures like answer choice B, the thyroid. Um, so why, why in this Chernobyl episode or, or in general, if somebody's uh, exposed to um, uh, uh, whatever radioactive iodine was in the nuclear power plant disaster, why, why give them potassium iodide? It's a, essentially a dilutional or competitive um, issue. So by giving... Uh, stable um, iodide in, in addition to the radioactive that there's a decreased kind of absorption of the radioactive um, isotope uh, and that and the idea they're limiting long-term risk of thyroid cancer or uh, thyroid dysfunction all right gotcha can we go through then the basic types of radioactive decay so alpha radiation beta radiation and and gamma radiation in in general so alpha from what i understand are positively charged particles and they're large 
That's right. Again, you can essentially think of it as being uh, helium. So there's two protons and two neutrons, so fairly large size. One of the things I didn't realize, but that's how smoke detectors for the most part work. Um, there's a small stream of alpha particles um, and just a little bit of smoke can bro- block that stream. And that's what uh, sets off a smoke detector. But uh, alpha particles in general, from a biologic standpoint, really aren't that worrisome or uh, helpful from a therapy standpoint uh, because they have such a high mass and charge that their ability to penetrate is very limited. The only exception there would be anything that kind of becomes absorbed in the body and is able to kind of permeate there. They are being used for therapy. The newest kind of kid on the block in terms of radiobiologics or one of the newest is radium-223, which is a Uh, kind of similar analog to calcium and is an alpha emitter that's used for prostate cancer with bone metastases only. I guess to take it one step further, beta also has uh, a mass and also has charge, but much lower mass. It's essentially an electron. Um, And so any kind of beta particle in tissue is going to be able to go to a little bit deeper, but you're still talking only millimeters. Uh, They had used beta emitters previously for prostate cancer, such as uh, strontium, And they were very damaging to the bone marrow, and so the therapeutic uh, usages were very limited. Um, And I believe strontium, I think I'm saying this right, but strontium-90 is one of the, it it has a half-life of, I think, of about 30 years. And that's one of the um, fission products that was an issue for Chernobyl and still is an issue because it's it's still present uh, and does kind of act uh, similar to calcium and is absorbed by the bone and kind of limits what they're able to do there at Chernobyl, Chernobyl even now. I did a lot more uh, <laughs> preparation for this this uh, series than, than I have for others. And I remember a, a story where they were talking about, I, I think it was strontium and these uh, radium girls, they were called. Uh, yeah, the radium girls. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of um, you know historical facts about you know the dial makers um, when they used radium for dials. Um, it was in a, a factory, and it was mostly women. And because they were kind of inhaling the radium, it, it got absorbed in their bones, and they ended up with all these strange sarcomas and various you know issues with bone marrow failure and different leukemias and lymphomas and things. Yeah, I heard they were like licking the uh, tips of brushes when they were yeah. getting some sort of watch and they ended up getting radium jaw, which sounds terrible. It sure does, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah, uh, beta particles, essentially electron. Um, I know radioactive iodine is in, in the setting of a nuclear fallout as occurred in at Chernobyl um, is also a particularly important isotope. Um, but radioactive iodine, that sounds, you know, like something we use um, for thyroid disease. That's right. We use uh, two different uh, isotopes of, of iodine, uh, iodine-123 and then iodine-131. Iodine-123 is used for imaging uh, with a, a gamma counter uh, and basically is used to see uh, areas of uptake of iodine. And then iodine-131 uh, is a beta emitter that is used uh, therapeutically, uh, generally for thyroid ablation or thyroid cancer ablation. So there's beta. Um, we're left with gamma radiation. I guess the the one thing that I I had trouble um, conceptualizing was this idea that these uh, workers in the Chernobyl factory were exposed to direct radiation when they were very close to the reactor core. Um, but then the real problem was the the fallout or the aerosolization of particles that, you know, I guess, if they didn't have radioactive material attached to them, um, it, it'd be essentially like ash, right? But affected with radioactive particles, it's ash plus these particles that emit radiation, gamma radiation, beta radiation. And so it gets in the water, people can inhale it. Even the animals who provide 
you know, I suppose eggs and, and milk and things like that could get into the, the food supply, in which case then you have an internal ingestion of radioactive material, which is not a good thing, I would imagine. That's right. And I, I don't know, know all the specifics of that. I know that there are certain isotopes uh, that are of the most concern. We've talked about two of them, I-131 and then uh, strontium-90. The other one um, is cesium-137, uh, which sits uh, on the periodic table just below potassium. Um, that also has an exceptionally long um, half-life of like 30 years. That's been used uh, for therapy as well. Uh, is was used for cervical cancer for years and years and years, but that one, you know, can get absorbed as well. And it's both a beta as well as a gamma emitter with a relatively high uh, energy gamma particle. Um, and so I, I know that those are some of the things that were the biggest concern, uh, particularly because they're all essentially water soluble salts. Um, and so, like you said, could get into the water supply and whatnot. Hey everyone. Thank you so much for listening. That's it for today's episode. It's the holidays now, and we know as med students you don't have a lot of money to contribute to ITB or really for anything. But we've thought of other ways that you could help us without having to spend any money. So if you're going to be shopping on Amazon this season, please go to insidetheboards.com shop and click on one of the Amazon links. It takes less than one minute, and after you click for any purchase you make on Amazon, we will get a small commission. You can also check out insidetheboards.com slash shop for curated items that we thought were pretty cool for the med student, doctor, or whomever in your life. Thanks to Ike Potter, this show's producer, for writing the question content, and to Chris Brightigan, the executive producer for this Chernobyl series. Tell your friends about the ITV podcast and join us next time as we continue this series. Special thanks to Enter Shikari for letting us use Radiate off the 2013 LP Rat Race. Check out Enter Shikari wherever you listen to music.